E noi abbiamo il piacere di avere qui con noi a, a raccontarci questo, il concetto di fondo è Eat Better and Produce Better. Abbiamo il vice direttore generale della FAO del Dipartimento di Sviluppo Sociale ed Economico, Massimo Torrero Cuglien, che invito qui per la sua relazione. Prego. So, uh, good morning to all of you, and, and thank you very much for San Petrignano for this kind invitation to participate in this conference. It's a real pleasure for FAO to be here, and the Director General of FAO sends his highest regards uh, to San Petrignano for all the efforts that are being done. So, I, I will try to, to bring a, a complex problem uh, uh, to all of you, which is responsible nutrition. Um, and, uh, it's complex because today we are not only talking of malnutrition, we are also talking of all other forms of malnutrition, which complicates uh, a little bit or a lot what we are doing because we are starting to have what we call trade-offs uh, because of combinations of happening, things happening simultaneously in terms of, of malnutrition. So my presentation uh, will first uh, try to bring what are the recent trends in hunger and malnutrition and then I'm starting to look at potential options and how we can move forward and what we are observing in terms of facts today uh, and what changes uh, we need to put in place. Now, we all have heard at the le global level that the poverty count, the poverty numbers and extreme poverty has been reducing. And we have significant reductions over time in terms of extreme poverty, which is really good for the world. But what we need to understand is that the way we measure poverty, the way the World Bank measures poverty, is basically a poverty line, $1.92. So once we move one cent over that poverty line, or extreme poverty line, we are no longer in extreme poverty. Now, imagine what will happen if there is a weather shock. Automatically, you will move back down into the poverty line. So that definition brings a complexity. We can move people out of that poverty line because it's basically to be able to compare internationally, but not necessarily that means that we are in a sustainable way out of that extreme poverty situation. Any little shock will move us in and out of that extreme poverty situation. To be able to be completely out of poverty and extreme poverty, we need to be in around $10 a day. That's more or less what we need. That's when we can talk that we are sustainable out of poverty, that shocks won't affect us, won't move inside the same situation. And I think that is reflected in this graph, what we are observing today in terms of undernourishment. Despite the reduction on extreme poverty, we are seeing a change in the trend of under undernourishment. Today, 121 million people are undernourished. After a period of, of it going down, we again are seeing an increase. And I can tell you that that increase is not changing. It could be that we're going to settle, but it's not going down again in the future. So we need to be very careful about this, and we need to understand in detail what is happening. And it's completely related to the fact of sustainability and how we can really move people and kids out of extreme situations. And that is also related to inequality. If we have the levels of inequality we have today, it's impossible to get to that $10 ideal that we need to get a day to be able to move sustainable out of this situation. Now, if we start to, to elaborate a little bit more and look into the detail uh, of the data, we find uh, that there is a chronic child malnutrition, what we call a stunting, has fallen and has continued to, to fall, and more infants are being exclusively breastfeed, which is good, it's an extremely good practice uh, to reduce undernutrition and malnutrition. But at the same time, we are finding that anemia is increasing, and especially we are also finding that obesity is substantially increasing. So more than two billion people are overweight uh, today or obese. And also the lack of these micronutrients, like for example the case of anemia, creates significant problems. So we have improved in undernourishment, in stunting especially, but we still have now this new problem uh, of obesity and also the issue of lack of micronutrients. But more important than that, look at the gray bars. The gray bars are the targets where we are supposed to arrive, look how far we are from those. 
So if we don't create the change, as it was mentioned in the previous presentation, it will be very difficult to get into those. And we will continue facing these situations of overlapping child stunting, anemia, and overweight, especially in women, for example. And we will have numbers as big as the ones uh, I am showing. Now, this problem is not only uh, at the global level, it has significant differences at the sub-regional level. This map is trying to bring uh, those differences. The orange, light color, is showing simultaneously overweight, anemia, and stunting. And look, the significant concentration we are facing in sub-Saharan Africa. It's where the three problems, the simultaneity of the, all these forms of malnutrition are happening. In the case of Latin America, for example, Peru is my country, in North America, the problem is more on overweight, which is a significant problem because it brings no communicable diseases. And for the ministers of finance, that's something to think carefully because normally they don't think too much on the potential future costs that this will imply to them. And therefore, what they need to do today to avoid those future costs. Normally, we are thinking of short periods of time and we are not thinking in the potential health costs that they will, this will bring in the future. So we need to find a solution to this. We need to think differently. And that's where the concept of sustainability of food systems, I think, uh, could play a significant role. Because we need to change the way we are operating at all fronts. Uh, and you will see exactly what I mean at the end of my presentation. Now, what is the role of food systems and why they are so important? As it has been mentioned by our previous presenter and also by others, uh, we have growing human pressure, population is going to, cross, to grow, but the demand of that population will change, and that is what will create more pressure. Now, if you ask me today, do we have enough food to satisfy the demand? I will answer yes, of course we have enough food, and that's why food prices are going down. If you ask me today, we will have enough food to satisfy the demand five years from now? I will say yes. But that doesn't mean that the food will be available to everybody in the same conditions. And that's what the previous map showed. And that's where we have the problem, that's what we need to find to resolve. We have enough technology today to resolve our problems in terms of food supply. Not in terms of quality of food, but in terms of food supply. At the same time, we are facing some problems of climate change, extreme weather events, and here is where the non-linearities are starting to happen. The new predictions of what will be the increase in temperatures are alarming, extremely alarming. And we need to find ways to resolve that. But once we are in a non-linear world, we have a lot of issues and a lot of complexities to resolve that. And it's not only the absolute temperature, it's also the variability of the temperature. What we in economics or in statistics call the second moment. That, that's the complexity. Because if I am a producer, I am a company, and the prices and the temperatures are varying so much, it's very difficult for me to make decisions on what to do because it could change the next morning or the next hour, the next day. So it's not only absolute values higher, it's also variability. And, I, and for us, that's the biggest concern, how we are going to handle that excessive volatility of temperatures that we are going to face in the following years because of those nonlinearities. In a world where the ecosystems are being challenged substantially, we have significant problems of water, and it's incredible, but people don't think carefully on, on water. When we trade goods, when we trade high-value commodities, we're also trading water. And there are very few countries which have a proper pricing of that water. But today, we don't have an international price of water. When I am trading a grape, when I am trading an apple, I am trading water. I am basically moving water from some countries, some regions, to others. And that's something that we need to think, because it's an externality that we need to value. And we are not valuing it. And water will be and is already a very scarce resource. And it's something that we need to think carefully. The same with the soils, that we need to look at them carefully and try to be more efficient in the way we use them. And of course, everything is linked also to surprise. What will happen in the future and the surprises that we will be facing that sometimes are behind everything of what we do and how we have to respond and how we have to be resilient. Now, this brings me to this concept of food systems. So a food system, at least for, for, for the way we are thinking at FAO, is very complex, but it's a, a good framework because it tells me all the interrelationships. 
If I want to increase productivity, I have to be careful on proper use of water, proper use of resources, because I want sustainability over time. It looks to me at all the value chains and other interlinkages with the ecosystem and trying to understand how to establish priorities. But the most important part of a food system is to identify what are the trade-offs. What are the trade-offs between the nexuses I can identify? Water, energy, food. What are the, the, the parts that are positive and the parts that are negative? And also allows me to identify, because of the heterogeneity that we face in the world, where I need to increase my intensity, where I need to increase my efforts to resolve the part of that food system that really matters for that region. So if I am in India and Andhra Pradesh, for example, my major problem right now is water. And I have wrong policies, subsidies to electricity to pump water. What I need to do there to resolve that problem, to fix that system? We talk a lot about solar power today. Now, irrigation by solar power is great. I can put nice pumps with solar power. But what is happening? We are over pumping because I don't longer need to pay for electricity. The investment of the solar panel was normally subsidized or was done through grants. Now I have my solar panels, the maintenance is pretty cheap, but I can pump water. What happens with the water frame goes down. So it's creating a problem for the future. So we need to find that equilibrium and we need to think all these linkages and trade-offs. That's the way we need to, to, to work with food systems. Of course, the objective is not to resolve the whole system. That's too complex and, and we don't have the capability to do that. But at least we can start to target and prioritize. And I think that's what should happen and that's what should happen also in the case of uh, agriculture and nutrition. Because we need to look at all the players, all the agents involved, it's not only the public sector, also the private sector, the agencies, the international organizations, but we need to be ready to be able to work on this and to be able to target properly and to be able to have the best possible information to understand what, what is happening. So let me bring you an example of why information is so good. This is one of the results uh, that has been presented in the Global Nutrition Report. And basically what it tells you is the level in which, no matter the income level of the level of consumption, of what we are eating in terms of vegetables, whole grains, legumes, and all are drinking uh, too much soda, for example, in what we are observing here. So we have an excess of saturated sodas, uh, of drinking sodas, but in most of the key micronutrients that we need to capture, no matter the income level, we are under them. So that provides me a lot of information of what we need to do. It's not only behavioral change at the consumer side, it's also supply change. We need to work with the private sector to find ways in which we can change the supply to be able to satisfy the demands. And why it's so important? Because in the latest study that was of the Lancet that was published a few weeks ago, basically what we observe is that across 21 regions, a diet in low uh, whole uh, grains, on consumption of grains, is the major cause of death. And in some regions, for example, if you look in the pie chart, the dark red area, uh, especially in the case of, of Asia Pacific, uh, the consumption of uh, sodium uh, creates a higher risk for deaths. So this level of consumption of micronutrients creates a huge probability that I will die. And of course you have to correlate with dailies. But what we need to think carefully here is that all the information that we have today allow us to think differently and to try to understand better, better what to do and to try to find solutions to the problems we are facing. Even more, for example, FAO has developed a new database where I can go to a country and identify what are the micronutrients that people are consuming. By looking to 12 hours recall, weeks recall of what people are eating and what are the gaps in their diets, how we can reduce the risk factors. What we are trying to do now is to link that to the supply. Local supply, but also supply through trade and see where the mismatches are. So that helps us to better improve the way we are consuming and what we are doing. So there are different policies that we can put in place to, to try to resolve these things. And we can apply the new ladder of policy interventions to do that. One option is to monitor and do nothing. The second one is to provide information, but that creates an impact. It could create a behavioral impact depending on the quality of the information, but it's not enough. Then we can guide the choice and modify the policy. We can also guide the choice through incentives or we can be tough and basically disincentive things like taxes to things that we know are wrong. Or we can eliminate or restrict the choice. 
say this is not, we cannot do this in this environment. Now, if we look at the different policies that are being implemented, for example, we can provide consumers with better information through food labeling, and we're doing a lot of effort to do that, and also to bring nutrition content to the food labeling. We can also uh, incentive to increase the availability of certain foods at affordable prices. If you look today to where most of the subsidies in food are going, most of them are going to staples. Although we are saying we have a problem of micronutrients, we have a problem of diets. But most of our subsidies are going to staples. So again, there is something not connected properly there. My system is not prioritizing properly. I can also uh, put correct incentives like support of farmers to high value commodities. Or on the contrary, I can put taxes. But we need to be very careful. It's not as simple as saying, let's tax sugar, and therefore people will consume less sugar. You have two effects when you tax sugar. One is companies could increase the intensity of sugar so that people become more addicted to the sugar and they keep consuming. The second effect, I can complicate an industry when really the content of sugar in the commodity is not well understood. So, so we need to be very careful in these policies. The only good policy I have seen, at least, in this type of, of taxes is in Chile. Chile has proven now that they have a package of policies. One of those is tax to sugar, that through those policies they were able to reduce the consumption of what we would call uh, food that was not appropriate and was creating problems of obesity. The result came uh, one month ago. It was an initiative pushed by a congressman uh, in Chile and they just were able to test the effects of the policy. But again, to be able to tax sugar, I need to have very good data. I need to know the content in each of the food elements of what is the amount of sugar, therefore I can measure elasticities and I can assess the potential impact of that tax. Again, the trade-offs are important. We need to understand better the trade-offs to be able to look at impact. And also, I can put restrictions, like restriction in the school's premises of eating certain types of foods that will allow me to improve the situation where we are. Now, all this brings us that the responsibility is not only for the public sector, it's not only for institutions like FAO, I think especially it's also with the private sector. The private sector also needs to understand that today we are facing this global production which is not consistent to what is recommended. So in the yellow bar here, you have what is recommended, diet, and in the blue bar, you have what we are supplying today, what is available today based on the statistics of FAO. As you will see, we have differences, significant differences. In the case of grains, in the case of vegetables, we are completely under to what we should be producing. So how we can reduce that and what role we have to play, what are the incentives that we need to put in place so that we can shift this and reduce these gaps so that we can move in a more sustainable way into what we are looking in terms of nutrition. And that requires the delivery of healthy diets that requires not only a supply effect, but also requires a behavioral change in the demand side. And that's where information can play a role. We need to bring them together to be able to resolve that. And that's the role of a place like FAO, is to try to bring information, try to bring statistics, try to bring best practices, self-self learning, to be able to reduce these problems and these differences and to minimize those trade-offs and to optimize especially in the world where we need to do what and where a priority is in one location. One nice example for what we are doing today is we are trying now to identify exactly what are the losses in the value chains across different countries of the world and trying to measure losses in the value chain. Not waste at this point, which we will do in the future, because it's more for developed countries, but for developing countries we are trying to identify where in the value chains are the losses and what are the magnitudes of those and then trying to see what policies we can do to reduce that. But we need to be careful of the trade-offs. If I reduce losses, I will have more food supply. If I have more su food supply, I will be better for the consumers, it will be worse for the producers. The producers are in the rural areas, they will be affected by lower prices. So how we can create demands also, and one way to do that is to improve the quality of food. Because by doing that, we are differentiating the product. The quality of the product I am producing by improving the quality of it, we'll create new markets for farmers and at the same time improve the efficiency in which I use my resources and I reduce my losses. So there is a lot that we can do, a lot that we can do to achieve the, MDG goal, the, the SDG goals. We were involved in the second international conference on nutrition, which launched the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, 
and the UN decade for, for nutrition. And that's where we need to bring as much as possible, the best possible data to resolve our problems so that we can have and make healthy diets affordable, available, focus on nutrition, but just not only to cal caloric intake, but to all forms of, of nutrition and align to the realities of the food systems. We need to work with the governments, we need to work with the businesses, and we need to work with the consumers. That's the only way we are going to resolve that. And let me just finalize uh, with this. So this is a quote uh, that was done, which says, so long as freedom from hunger is only half a shift, so long as two thirds of the nations have food deficits, no citizen, no nation can afford to be satisfied. We have the ability as members of the human race, we have the means, we have the capacity to eliminate hunger from the face of the earth in our lifetime. We need only the will. You know when this was written? President Kennedy in 1963. So in 1963, they were saying that we have the means to do it. Later on, something similar. In 1964, Henry Kissinger. And later on, FAO said about by year 2000, we will have eliminated this problem. So let me finish by saying we cannot continue failing. We need to resolve this problem, and we need to put our efforts to resolve this problem. Thank you very much.